Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, unfortunately, I do not speak Norwegian or Swedish. I speak a little bit of English with strong Russian accents, so sorry about that. Uh, my name is Yaroslav Rosomacho. I uh, am with Arbor Networks. I have been with Arbor Networks for quite some time, for six years now. And today I would like to give you a brief overview of um, flexible layered DDoS mitigation approach, how to deal with DDoS attacks. I expect uh, that there will be a little bit of overlap with previous presentation. Unfortunately, I couldn't understand much other than certain terms that uh, have been uh, referred to such as low orbit iron cannon network time protocol and uh, we'll see actually a little bit of those terms in my presentation as well. So before I dive into certain uh, products and offerings that we have, I would like to share with you certain statistics and uh, I thought it would be interesting to put things into perspective first. So first of all, um, is DDoS a new thing? Is DDoS something that just started to happen or was DDoS around for quite some time. Actually, interestingly enough, DDoS have been around for at least 15 years now. One of the first DDoS attacks that were seen in the wild, uh, DDoS attacks, uh, uh, well, there were simple TCP SYN floods back in uh, year 2000, uh, but nobody was really prepared to deal with them. Before that, DDoS was kind of theoretical possibility. So when our company was founded back in 2000, we struggle a little bit with uh, venture capitalists trying to get interest in the DDoS subject. Uh, however, these days, uh, it's no longer a question, is DDoS a threat? Even if you look into the news, you look into generic press, not necessarily specialized security press, you will see that, oh, DDoS here, DDoS there, and even if you talk to a typical uh, CEO in the company uh, that does something over the internet, when you mention DDoS, you might hear that, oh yeah, that does ring a bell. It has to do something with, with security, with maybe availability. And uh, when I started at Arbor six years ago, it was still kind of often got blank faces when I spoke about DDoS. So what happened? Did uh, DDoS suddenly change itself? So it became much more dangerous? Well, uh, the main reason what I believe have changed is the impact the impact of the internet on everybody's lives. So internet availability is no longer uh, an optional nice to have thing. If uh, let's say 10 years ago, website of a bank went down because of DDoS attack, that wouldn't probably make it into national news. That might not even affect bank uh, short, mid-term, long-term revenue. These days, it's a major event. These days, people rely on internet availability for pretty much everything, and if they cannot get to the website they need, especially if that has something to do with their finance, then it is a big thing. It does make it into the press, and uh, that's why DDoS is becoming more and more relevant. And for many attackers out there, uh, to make an impact, it's quite often more easy to launch a DDoS attack against the target uh, and get significant impact versus trying to create some advanced threats, getting to infiltrate the certain organization and do some damage otherwise. So that's one of the reasons that we, why we hear more and more about uh, DDoS all the time, even from generic press. And in fact, DDoS attacks do uh, happen much, much more frequently than they have been before. Now, in terms of types of uh, DDoS attacks that we see, uh, so, on one hand, those traditional DDoS attacks like floods, they're not going away. Uh, SYN floods, UDP floods, they're still here and they're actually not decreasing. They're growing, they're becoming much more powerful. It's very easy to talk to them. You quite often, when you listen to news about DDoS, you hear scary numbers like 300 gigabit per second attack, 400 gigabit per second attack. Very scary, easy to talk about. However, it's not just about those floods. Uh, these days, attackers quite often use small attacks or state exhaustion or application layer attacks. Those types of attacks can be as deadly as large volumetric floods, but instead of targeting network infrastructure, instead of trying to overwhelm the last mile or point of presence where this last mile is connected or maybe even service provider connectivity, those application layer and state exhaustion attacks, they target 
application itself, maybe even backend database behind the application, or stateful security devices that might be located on the customer side or on service provider side. So all those stateful uh, security devices such as firewalls, IPSs, load balancers in some cases, next generation firewalls and what have you, they all share common flaw, that is session state table. So this is for every connection that needs to be established from client to server, they need to allocate a certain state, they need to do some work, and for whole duration of the session, they need to fix up the session. And more features you have on that device, the more session you have there, so the more potential vulner vulnerability to uh, state exhaustion and application layers attacks that you've got. Another reason why uh, state exhaustion and application layer attacks are gaining popularity is because it's much harder to detect them. So imagine when you're under volumetric attack, you have all of a sudden 100 gig coming your way. It's fairly easy to detect. You look at SNMP counters, you look at MRTG or CACTI or whatever tool that you're using for traffic monitoring, and you say, oh, we have a huge spike. It must be a DDoS attack. Let's do something about it. So you know what that is. You might not have means to stop it easily, but you, at least you know what's happening. Now, with state exhaustion, with application layer attack, all you know is that oof, all of a sudden the website is not opening, application is not responsive, or responsive but very slow. What's the reason for that? That's quite a troubleshooting exercise. In some cases that might take days before you realize that, oh, that is actually application layer or state exhaustion attack that is hitting you. Now, in terms of verticals that might be affected by DDoS, so obviously this it's come back, comes back to uh, attacker motivations and the importance of internet in everyday lives. So, of course, we see more activities in certain, let's say, sensitive verticals, such as online gaming and online gambling. So these uh, kind of organizations are hit by DDoS attacks more often than others. But, uh, of course, finance, government and others, and pretty much everybody who have any form of internet access. Because what DDoS gives to attackers is not just ability to bring down something, it gives them an ability to make a fairly anonymized impact. So in DDoS attacks, typically bots are used, botnets are used, right? And these botnets are controlled by remote botnet and control center somehow, uh, using peer-to-peer -peer communication, using RC channels, using whatever. And just by looking at DDoS traffic, it's quite hard to find who is behind the DDoS attack. In most cases, it's just impossible. So it gives great sense of anonymity to attackers and they can, it could be a competitor, it could be a script kitty, it could be cyber warfare. It's very hard to say who is behind, who is actually behind the attack. Now, another interesting trend that we see is quite often DDoS attacks are delivered to give extra pressure to security teams, to distract them, to keep them entertained while attackers are doing something else at the same time. So very often DDoS attacks are used as a smoke screen. So attackers start to do something, so make sure that uh, the security team is busy fixing their firewall, the security team is busy uh, you know, trying to troubleshoot this event and uh, optimize their configuration, reduce the load, and at the same time, um, attackers are doing something malicious to steal data, something much more, much less visible while the, there is this DDoS attack going on. So DDoS could be a part of bigger campaign of a uh, bigger uh, advanced threat that is delivered to the uh, enterprise. So um, very often when I uh, do these presentations, I get questions, but oh, well, our country is not is not really evil, it's good country, we don't really have enemies, and my organization that I work for, they say, is very um, um, simple going, we don't really have any competitors, or any dangerous competitors, so who would ever attack us? So it's uh, given that we have been in this market for quite some time and de developed fairly unique relationships with service providers, we have built something called Atlas Internet Observatory. So Atlas Internet Observatory, uh, is actually a well, cloud-based architecture that we have where we get information from more than 300 of, world of world world's large largest ISPs. So those 300 ISPs deliver to us anonymous statistics on what is going on in their networks. Of course, it is relatively high level sampled statistics, but on another hand, that allows us to tap into about 25% of worldwide internet traffic. 
and uh, we can see quite interesting things there, including DDoS attacks. So I have picked, I have, uh, prior to this presentation, I have looked into statistics that we have specific to Norway, and uh, this is what I have seen. So for uh, 2015, Q1, Q2, Q3, those are the peak uh, DDoS attacks that we have seen in terms of volumetric attacks targeted to certain IP addresses located inside Norway. So in Q3, we have seen 113 gigabit per second uh, volumetric flood against some uh, IP address in Norway. Quite scary if you are not prepared to deal with that matter. Uh, in terms of uh, volume of attacks, uh, actually 50% of attacks are bigger than 1 gigabit per second, and 50% of attacks are smaller than 1 gigabit per second. That's an interesting mix. So you have on one hand a significant proportion of attacks that are clearly volumetric, that needs typically to be, to be uh, uh, fixed on service provider side, on, on somebody, uh, by, by somebody who have more than one gigabit per second of internet capacity. On another hand, you have, again, pretty much the same number of application layer and state exhaustion DDoS attacks that are quite hard to detect and mitigate on service provider side if you don't have very uh, good relationships with your customers and able to look into every single packet. Uh, now, uh, again, I don't know all the details about previous presentation, but network time protocol was mentioned. So this is one of the classic protocols that is used to deliver volumetric attacks using amplification and reflection vectors. So what happens is there are many, uh, well, open NTP servers uh, that are happy to accept a request for time for, from any server out, from any client out there, out there, and they don't have any means to detect if that I source IP address is a real one or spoofed one. So attackers quite often use uh, that uh, technique to create a spoofed volumetric flood. So they they use a botnet that spoofs their IP address to be IP address of actual victim, send requests to loads of different NTP recursive servers, or oh, sorry, NTP uh, servers, and then these NTP servers reflect, send, send response messages to the uh, actual victim. So there are three major, pro well, four major protocols are used uh, in the wild for these amplification reflection attacks. DNS, uh, NTP, SSDP, and Chargen, and you can see quite an interesting distribution for Norway uh, across those protocols. Uh, recently, we see quite a rise on, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, on SSDP uh, side. So SSDP is a protocol that is used in, by universal plug-and-play devices, such as smart CP devices that announce themselves to the home network, or smart TV devices that uh, use universal plug-and-play to broadcast to their home networks that there is an endpoint available for, DVLA, uh, for um, DLNA and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, many of those devices are exposed to the Internet and could be used for amplification and reflection. Now, in terms of uh, Arbor networks, so... As I said, we have fairly unique visibility into what is happening in the Internet. Uh, it's uh, impossible to plot all the DDoS attacks that are happening live on a single chart. Uh, however, we joined uh, our forces together with Google to create something called digitalattackmap.com that gives you a sample of what is happening in the Internet. So if you go into digitalattackmap.com, you get quite interesting snapshot of what is happening right now. You can look into historical statistics and uh, you can drill down into any, in any single country if you're interested and so on and so forth. Significant proportion of those attacks that you will see, they will go, well, to the space or from the space. It's not aliens attacking us. Unfortunately, uh, most of information that we're getting is anonymized. So we can get only information about either source of attack or if uh, ISP uh, who is sharing with us this information is serving the destination or other way around. If ISP is providing access to the destination of the attack, then we can share source with digitalattackmap.com so to preserve anonymity of our ISPs. Uh, but again, as I said, that gives you a good idea of how busy is it out there with DDoS attacks. So, uh, as I have mentioned, DDoS can be many things. And DDoS is fairly busy and evolving field. Uh, so how do we deal with those attacks? Um, 
So first of all, I would like to classify DDoS attacks in two uh, major parts. So there are large volumetric attacks, those 100 gig per second attacks, 10 gigs per second attacks, typically ampl amplification and reflection is used to deliver those attacks, but not necessarily. And obviously, no matter what kind of magical device you have on your data center, you do need help from somebody with greater connectivity than the DDoS attack. It's either ISP or it is some kind of cloud entity that could help enterprise to deal with these sorts of attack. And the second type of attack is state exhaustion application layer attack. So state exhaustion application layer attacks, they are fairly hard to detect on service provider side using NetFlow telemetry or using other uh, scalable means of detection that service providers might have, but they could be quite as deadly as state exhaustion attacks. So to stop those attacks, we recommend deploying uh, a device on the customer side or as close to customer edge as possible that would be deployed in line and would look into every single packet that is going to, to the customer. So, um, and in terms of architecture, the multi-layer architecture that we recommend to stop attacks, that's what, that, that's what we reflect on. So uh, we recommend uh, customers and customers' data centers deploy an inline uh, APS device, availability protection system. Uh, we have quite a range of those devices from 500 Mac up to 40 gigabit per second of inline mitigation capacity with very enterprise-friendly UI. And by the way, starting um, from September this year, those devices are also available in virtual format, uh, licensed from 50 megabit per second up to one gigabit per second. Uh, and uh, on service provider side, uh, we have a solution called uh, Arbor Networks SP. So idea of Arbor Networks SP is to deliver three major value propositions to service providers. So first of all is to give them visibility into what is going on. So for that, we, have, uh, we collect flow information from the network. It could be Cisco NetFlow, it could be IP fix, it could be S-Flow, C-Flow, whatever flow technology device, devices in the network support. Effectively, we use network probes, network routers, switches that are in the network as probes for uh, Arbor Networks SP TMS system. Uh, then we have, obviously, DDoS mitigation capabilities. Uh, for that, on service provider side, we have a special device that's called TMS, Threat Management System. So in order to be scalable for service provider environment, instead of deploying TMS as inline, we recommend so-called BGP off-ramp deployment method. So when TMS is, an, is making a BGP announcement into service provider uh, IPMPLS backbone, only when there is certain thing under DDoS attack, only when a DDoS mitigation intelligence, DDo, intelligent DDoS mitigation is required for that destination IP address. And finally, ability to provide managed security services. So that's all part of uh, SPTMS package that uh, we have been uh, uh, delivering to service providers for nearly 15 years now. Uh, so, um, in terms of how that, that all looks, so here we have some traffic hitting our edge routers, and there is obviously a mix of good and bad traffic. Would be easy if that was just good or bad traffic. Unfortunately, it's not always easy. And by the way, before moving further, it's worth noting that not all DDoS attacks actually require intelligent DDoS mitigation. They all require intelligent DDoS detection. So if that is, for example, a UDP destination port 80 flood, against a web server that serves only TCP, then, uh, well, probably the best course of mitigation would be just to deploy an access list on the edge router and forget about this matter. But if that is a bit more sophisticated DDoS attack that cannot be solved with an access list, then what? So first step, as I said, is to detect, and that's why we, uh, to have scalable detection, that's why we rely on uh, NetFlow technology. So we, we collect NetFlow uh, together with uh, BGP, together with SNMP, and correlate that all together. And then, uh, after we have detected that something is wrong, and uh, either manual, uh, manually a uh, system administrator decides to start DDoS mitigation, or system is configured for auto mitigation, then traffic can be off-ramped to the mitigation device, or mitigation devices for cleaning, and good traffic is returned back uh, into the customer uh, network. So, um, and uh, finally, the second part of uh, the overall solution is APS device. 
So APS device is designed for enterprise inline mitigation. Uh, it has integrated hardware bypass on all interfaces, like you would you should have on all kinds of inline devices. So if something goes bad with hardware, with power, with what have you, it turns itself into a wire. Um, and this hardware bypass is available on all interfaces, including copper and fiber. And there is quite a range of interfaces available, uh, of, sorry, uh, performance options available from 500 Mac up to 40 uh, gigabit per second on physical format as well as virtual options. So great things about APS is that it is enterprise friendly, have very attractive, very easy to use UI, and easy to use UIs are critical for security product for products, because the last thing that you want to do when you actually use security product is to struggle with the UI. User interface needs to help you to do the right thing. Security products, after all, are tools to do the security. They are not certain holy grail magical black boxes that just do security and you forget about them. Would be nice to have, but that's not realistic, unfortunately. So, um, and APS can also talk to SPTMS that is deployed on the service provider side by using our proprietary cloud signaling protocol. So if APS sees a DDoS attack going on, and if this DDoS attack is quite big, so APS cannot deal with this DDoS attack on itself, it can signal upstream to service provider asking for mitigation and informs what kind of DDoS attack we see and destination prefix that is being under uh, DDoS attack. As a response to that, on the APS side, we see if service provider have actually started extra mitigation on their end and uh, how much traffic is being dropped on the service provider in the cloud. So enterprise can, data center can evaluate oh, how big is the DDoS attack, do we still need extra help from service provider system to, to do the DDoS mitigation. I'm sorry, I have a bit run over the time. Uh, however, are there any questions? No? Thank you very much.